Hello and welcome to our first webinar of 2022. Can you believe we have finally arrived out of 2021 and we're back with you on stage in 2022. It is so wonderful to have everybody here with us. This has been um, an incredible topic and incredible webinar to host because it has exploded in the South African schools. We have over 400 schools registered actually for the webinar. Um, we have one whole school reached Rittendale, sorry, um, up in Pretoria, whose entire staff is watching it. So welcome. We'd love some pictures of that. Connect with us on Facebook. We'd love to see your um, your watch parties if you're having them. But today's topic is a giant topic, and we are so 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 looking forward to the expert speakers we have lined up for you today and tomorrow. So overcoming digital dangers is not at all about fear mongering, and many might be wondering why we have reversed our usual focal point of digitalization of schools and the adoption of technology. But to many of you, you might know Pete and I, and you might not know Pete and I, but we are also parents. And oftentimes we, um, yeah, we find ourselves having these discussions about the amazing adoption of technology in schools, um, many of the schools that we work with. And um, yeah, we, we um, also find that we discuss the things that are a little bit scary to us as parents in those schools. Um, our kids are in some of the best schools in Stellenbosch, I feel like. Strangely, mine is in an Afrikaans school, believe it or not. Um, welcome to all Afrikaans schools out there. You are parenting and or teaching our kids beautifully. And Pete's on an English school here. And those schools are really, yeah, I mean, they're on the technological adoption process. But I think our hope is with these webinars is that um, we won't only be showing new technology at our Schoolscape webinars and our Schoolscape premiere events coming up and that that's amazing and that's taking education and teaching forward, but that we would also start to ring fence our schools um, with protection and the right policies and the right um, solutions that really would not only enable us to use the technology and our kids to use the technology well, but also to protect them from some of those more dangerous things that technology brings in its exposure. So um, our hope is today is not to um, completely rely on our poor IT managers that are on um, on the webinar today. We know that your basket is so heavy laden already with all the things that you're doing in the schools. That you can't also now be a security expert, but the idea is to um, make this something that our whole school buys into um, and is equipped in and bring in the experts and we have these discussions and we start these discussions and hopefully all of us feel like we have a little bit better tools and solutions at the end of the day to protect our kids, to protect our teachers and to protect the reputation of our schools as well. So we are very excited um, to unpack this uh, very fun topic of overcoming digital dangers and what couldn't be a better day to do it on as today is Safer Internet Day. <laughs> so we are um, on the ball and on the money here. We are busy doing our part, each one of us, by being here on Safer Internet Day and really unpacking these topics. So um, yeah, I think without any better um, thing to say from my side, I'd like to just go through two house rules. One, these are recorded. You will get a link to watch them afterwards. If you miss today's or tomorrow's, you'll also get a link to watch them in your inboxes as soon as they are finished. You can also come back onto your links and re-watch them or share them with um, friends or educators alike. The other thing is, is a quick insert uh, of Schoolscape Premier, which is happening back in person. We're going back to in-person events. We love our online world, but we are also very excited to see you face to face, to give you great coffee, to feed you nice food, and to come meet many of these speakers and um, educational suppliers that are going to be on today and a hundred more alike at our Schoolscape Premier event. So if you're from Cape Town or Joburg and you're part of your school's management team or leadership team or procurement team, please come and join us at Schoolscape Premier. At the end of this, um, someone can post in the chat the link to register. It's for free for schools and we'd love to see you there. Um, and that's in Cape Town on the 4th of March and in Joburg on the 11th of March. Right. Let's jump into our agenda for today. Right. First up, we have Josh Ramsey. He's from Be In Touch. Be In Touch really is working, uh, uh, one line of them, they're working to keep our kids safe and sane online. They're an incredible company, they're doing a lot of really good work into addressing topics like this, and they put together a report on what they're really seeing in the schools that they work with. So we're excited to have Josh welcome on stage. He's a new face to Schoolscape, I feel like, not entirely new, you have been part of one thing before, I think, in the past, but um, 
hopefully a face we're going to see a lot more of. Josh has got a lot of good stuff to say, I've, I've, I've found in our discussions. But yes, Josh, welcome. We're really looking forward to what you have to say today. You are really the expert. So I'm going to now jump off stage, <laughs> hand it over to you. And um, Josh, I'm sad to see your background today. Usually we have this cute kid shouting and crying in the background like all of our online worlds. He's <laughs> somehow silenced her and now your fancy background looks great. But Josh, welcome to Schoolscape. It's so good to have you here. And uh, yeah, take it away with unpacking some real stats for us on what's going on. Absolutely. It is uh, such a wonderful joy to be here, to be in a full house, which is even better than just being here. We've got 156 people in the room, which is absolutely amazing. And yeah, Ashley is right. I've done a presentation to the South African Educational Law Association, just speaking about social media, how it's impacting children's lives. But today we're gonna to be answering this question and asking this question of you as educators. What if you knew exactly what your students were struggling with online? See, this online space is such a big, black, muddy puddle. And we hope that the efforts that we take are gonna be making a difference but at Be In Touch, we focused on making sure that you know exactly what the challenges are that your students are dealing with. So in today's presentation, I'm going to take you through the high level of the statistics that we've gathered from surveying over one and a half thousand South African students, many of them in schools much like yours. We're also going to talk to you about what you can do in your own school to address this challenge of finding information and then giving relevant and responsive answers. So we're looking forward to that time. And just again, a massive thank you to Schoolscape for being here. And just to speak one word into Safer Internet Day. At Be In Touch, we like to push this idea that every day should be Safer Internet Day. And uh, the only way that you can make every day Safer Internet Day is with ongoing interventions to keep our children safer and saner online. Um, along with co-founder co Kate Farina, we do run Be In Touch and we are pro-tech, we absolutely love technology and we try to innovate as much as possible to keep the children uh, interested, You know, using as many little things as we can like that to just keep the moment alive for them because this is where they live. And um, before we jump into the high level stats that I wanna share with you, I wanna run two polls back to back. The first one is gonna be what percentage of kids do you think sleep with their phones in their rooms? And I'm going to come back to why that's important in just a moment. But if we can just launch that poll now, uh, the Schoolscape team can get that poll up and we can decide, you know, what percentage of children sleep in their, with their phones in their rooms at night. Um, I'm not seeing a poll come up, so I'm going to keep talking because sometimes technology gets in the way of a, of a good afternoon. I know that's happened to me numerous times before. So if the polls aren't there, no worries. We can always come back to it at a later stage and uh, and uh, look at how that impacts our perspectives on this. So let's have a high level look at the statistics that we have in the digital well-being space. It's important that we understand that our children's digital lives are their real lives. There is no distinction. They are simply one in the same to them. So what we what we see is that over 54% of children above the age of four have a phone, sorry, age of 10, not age of four, have a phone, and that 68% of them have social media by age 12. Of course, you'll know that social media is supposed to only be accessed from age 13. So very good proof that age gating is, is, a, is a bigger conversation, age appropriate content is a bigger conversation, and it's something that we're not necessarily getting right. Now, when we look at the perfect storm, here's the three aspects of the perfect storm. Phones in rooms at night, 66% of kids. No parental controls, 63%. And then cyberbullying late at night, 83%. So we have to, you know, one clear win is for you as a school to decide that, you know, phones are, are not accessible at certain times or in certain places. But for your parents as well, they need to be picking up the slack because you can't be doing both sides of holding this uh, digital safety net to protect your kids. And we're gonna speak into responsibilities and where they lie in just a moment. But why I share these stats is really for you to understand that your school is unique. The challenges that your school is facing in the digital landscape are unique. You might have a pornography exposure issue with your grade sevens that you don't have with your grade eights because there was a camp that happened on grade seven. And so a more appropriate conversation to be having with your grade sevens is about pornography awareness and not changing passwords, passwords or whatever the curriculum prescribed is on hand. So you need to be entering this discourse 
with students. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next moment. The two crucial components to understanding your student's digital landscape. The first is what we call student voice. You've probably heard about this a million times before, but making it that, that transition into the digital well-being space is absolutely essential. So we need to be amplifying student voice so that we can understand the complications and challenges that are happening in their digital worlds. We do that uh, here at Be In Touch with various surveys, polls, anonymous chat, and technologies to make that come alive. But it's something that you need to be looking at in the culture of your school. Are we giving a voice to our students? And again, there's a lot of wonderful uh, technology solutions that can make that a very, very seamless process. Another big piece on this is student voice when it comes to reporting inappropriate contact or boundary violation, what we call safeguarding. So we do a lot of work in, in the overseas kind of spaces where they're quite a few years ahead in the safeguarding uh, kind of development space. And it's definitely something that we need South African schools to get more in line with international standards on safeguarding, which is giving a facil facilitating a space where that student voice can be heard. I'm trying to move through here so we can get to the stats on the high level, drilling into all the different areas of concern, and then to take some Q&A. But I can't do that without talking about student agency. Now, the best way that you're going to see culture change in yes. your school. If I can jump on here, sorry. Um, sure. Before you jump into the next thing, what I wanted to um, just encourage, the polls are in the, if you're looking at your screen, they're in the right-hand side corner down at the bottom. It says polls. You can click on them. You can answer them at any time. Um, so that's where the polls are. Next to that button, you'll see there's a questions button. Any questions you have for Josh, please, throughout his talk, pop them in there so that I can pose them to him at the end. So please feel free to use that questions tab, and I will then address live those questions when we get to the end of the talk. Okay, Josh, back over to you. Thanks so much, Ashley. Yeah, um, as someone that deals with these technology challenges all the time, if something doesn't work in the first 30 seconds, I just got to move on because I know that we got limited time and a full agenda of amazing content for our teachers. So uh, don't worry about the polls. We've already covered that content, but please put some questions into the chat that we can explore in the Q&A uh, session. So we were talking about student agency and trying to drive behavior change in your school to keep them safer online. Again, if they don't have that voice, and then if you don't take that voice and translate it into an action that you instill in your school, a campaign to change, a video series, uh, whatever intervention that you're going to put in place, and you report on the impact of that intervention, you're not going to get a closed loop on building student agency. Okay, so with that in mind, we all have to play our part. And this is great news to teachers. Whenever we give our presentations to teachers, they they look at this slide and they take a massive sigh of relief, right? Because you guys are showing up. There's 150 of you or more in this webinar right now learning about how you can educate and mentor your students. But we have to turn the, the, the ball over to the parents. We have to say to them, guys, it's your role to protect and guide. And that's why, you know, when we partner with a school, we partner with their parent body directly. So the parents can never turn around to the school and say, you're not doing enough. The school needs to be in a position, whichever provider you use, and there's some amazing ones on this, uh, on this webinar and you know, the in-person events, but you need to be able to confidently stand up in front of your parent body and say, we're doing our part. Are you doing yours? And we do that to make sure that both sides of this digital safety net are held to make sure that our kids are not falling through that digital, uh, that digital divide that exists between uh, schools and parents. Okay. So we're going to dive into a little bit more detail on the stats themselves so that you can get you know, more of an idea of what children are actually dealing with. As I spoke about uh, in that first slide, over 50% have their phones by age 10. Uh, no parental controls. We're looking at around 60-something percent. And then phones kept in the bedroom at night, very big deal, up at around 70%. And we know that a lot of the cyberbullying is happening on social media. So phones in bedrooms major area of concern and a majorly easy one to intervene on to change something in your school's culture overnight. Social media, we're seeing that you know almost 70% have social media by 12. Of course, that is not the age they're supposed to be on it. We know that the vast majority of bullying happens on social media. And stranger contact, guys, this uh, we're going to drill down to in more detail, but this is a major area of concern. We've got upwards of 60% of children saying that they've been contacted by a stranger online, and we don't know the nature of that content. 
that contact. It might be just meeting someone in an online game, but it might be something more nefarious and definitely of concern. So making sure that you have filters in place, whether it's software, hardware, uh, regulatory policy, there's so many angles that you can look at this digital well-being challenge to make it safer and saner for your kids. Online bullying continues to be an issue that we face. Uh, we know that over 25% of kids have been bullied online. And yeah, we're talking about more serious, you know, intentional repetitive bullying, as opposed to just rudeness as, uh, as um, you know, a lot of bullying can just be someone being rude once off. But what is important here is that 83% of that bullying is happening online. And that is where a lot of bad decisions are made. A lot of grooming happens. So again, speaking to that fact that as a policy, if you're a boarding house, get those devices out of the bedrooms, out of the dorms, and make sure that you have some form of parental control in place. So pornography is a major issue, um, continues to be. And, you know, I start my school talks uh, and I'll take you through how we talk to schools so that we can get this, uh, this, this data from them. Um, but I talk to, to students and I used to start my talks with, hey, my name's Josh. I was exposed to pornography at age nine. And that used to make me quite special. But these days we're seeing about 20 percent of children by age 10 have already seen pornography and a very sad state of affairs. Obviously, a lot of it's happening on the Internet and then a lot of it being first exposure at home. So that just speaks to the fact that parents don't have any filters at the home space. Um, I want to interject just a question that has come up here because I think it's an important one. Um, how do we as parents get to implement the no phones in bedrooms at night? So what you do is that ideally you get us into your school so that we can get the information of what your children are struggling with and then you share that with the parents. It helps to have an independent source to actually say to the parents, this is the reality and then this is what you can do about it. Um, we'll definitely share some of the links of, for example, Childhood 2.0, which is a wonderful uh, wake up documentary uh, created by Bark that will wake parents up. But we do a lot of our work to, to get rid of the not my kid syndrome. And not my kid syndrome is one of the big drivers why sexting has absolutely exploded. You know, we're looking at over 30% of children have been asked to send a nude photo, whether that's a photo of themselves or a pornography picture. You know, at the end of the day, it's still massively adult content. And what is also concerning is that we're heading towards 10% of children that have sent that nude. So not only are they getting that request that might be unsolicited, they're actually taking that step to share the content themselves. Uh, and then, of course, over 30 percent of them having been sent a nude. I've got one last little statistic to show you, and it's a uh, it's again mixed feelings because I'm excited that we get to talk about this conversation. But I get heartbroken at what we are talking about. We're seeing a massive rise rise in self-harm and suicide ideation, whether it's real or not, just for attention. It is serious and it needs to be focused on and children need to be um, uh, empowered as to why looking at this content flippin, flippant, flippantly, flippantly <laughs> is a bad idea. So, you know, over 30% of kids have seen someone threaten to harm themselves online and about the same amount threatening to harm themselves. So we share these statistics because we want to get you active. We don't want to get you anxious, as Ashley said. Um, this is a layout of the digital well-being space. We all know that this is important. You know, the registrations to this webinar are proof of that. So let's get into what you can do about it. This is the important part where we talk about solutions. We're going to give you the be in touch solution. Obviously, you can run this in-house. Don't, you know, wait for us if we, you know, we're very busy at the moment. We're always looking to work with new schools. But you can take these ideas and as an LO teacher or someone else, you can implement them in some way in your school. Obviously, we're more than happy to help you, and we're going to be con uh, making an offer to you guys to contact us directly at the close of this webinar. But we take our kids and our schools through four stages of keeping them safer and saner online. Firstly, we normalize the need for asking for help. That's my story, you know, digital substance abuse, then physical substance abuse, uh, ending up in depression, back on my parents' couch. I normalize, I do the vulnerability piece and I talk about my issues. I get them to ask questions about it. And then once we've built rapport and you need to have that rapport before you just ask a blind survey, well, is you're gonna get bad data or you're gonna get bad actors that are gonna mix your data up. So then you ask them, what's going on in your world? Tell us about it. We turn that into very powerful reports that we share with teachers, parents and students. And then we, and this is the important bit, we keep 
on supporting. It's not a once off. It's not one webinar and done. And there's no app that solves it. There's no video series that solves it. Different things work for different kids and different parents. There has to be consistent and intentional attention placed on your digital well-being as you move along. Okay. So a little bit of normalizing. I was a golden boy at school. I uh, got everything right. A head boy, head of school, rugby captain. As soon as I went to university, the wheels fell off and I was an addicted, anxious mess. Ended up, as I said, living back at home, um, using pornography to manage my emotions. And then I started to seek pur purpose and eventually started a family. And I have a lot more balance and accountability now and meaning through relationship. So we don't position this talk as a digital safety talk or a digital citizenship talk. Instead, we position it as a vulnerable modeling. It's a modeling to say it's okay to ask for help and it's based on critical thinking. So making sure that the kids know that the choices they make will lead to the consequences that become their life. So it kind of sits in that motivational space uh, and, and by that we get around their digital citizenship uh, filters that they have up already because of you know, the last two years of content coming their way. So a big part of normalizing it is talking about addiction, helping them understand that, you know, getting a quick reward to discomfort is not the way forward. You have to be developing skills to deal with the discomfort in your life. And uh, we share more on that uh, age appropriately, of course. We use amazing technology to make sure that the, the kids can share. So use those anonymous surveys, use chat functions. We use Slido, really great app. Definitely check them out. Uh, Canva and Slido, those are the backbones of our business. Uh, and through Slido, we get these great questions coming through. And you can use these to inform your LO focus, to make sure that you're in the right places, dealing with relevant uh, questions. So quick question came through. How do you make sure the parents attend the, 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 the webinar? Well, you have to show them that you're buying in. And hopefully the kids are talking to their parents about it. So we deal with all three aspects at the same time. Here's the survey that we spoke to you about. We're just collecting all that information, putting it together in a shiny report to make sure that everyone's on the same page and we can get buy-in. And then we make sure that there's that ongoing support, guys. You have to be supporting your parents. You have to be supporting your students and your teachers. Don't uh, put this, as Ashley said, this is not the IT guy's problem. Okay, this is not the LO person's problem. This is a staff-wide initiative to change the culture in your school. Bullying doesn't stop because you put up stop bullying signs. It stops because you change the value of kindness. You teach empathy. And uh, we use a bunch of documentary screenings, um, campaigns on culture change, and various ways to empower teachers to run these in school. You know, we know that you guys are working with limited budgets, so we try and make them as available to you, run the, to you running them in-house as possible. We support the parents. That's where we come in. You hand them over to us and we are the ones that send them a weekly reminder about free webinars that we go, that we are running, uh, offers to get Griffin routers into their home or bark parental control onto their phones. So we become that shield to you where you can say, well, before you ask me, did you go to the webinar that we offered to you through our partner, Be In Touch? Did you look at their resource page where they've got a family digital alliance and a uh, uh, you know, a smartphone contract and a settings guide. So all of these things you can point your parents to because they need to be taking up responsibility on their digital parenting role. So our top tips. Uh, these are the tips that we talk about all the time. We have our eight steps to family digital wellness, but these are our top five tips that we recommend to parents all the time. Getting some form of agreement on family tech use in the home, installing parental controls. You have to have parental controls these days. You need a digital sense to track your children in their digital landscape because that's where they live their lives. And I'll, you know, one statement that we love from one of the senior leaders of Bark is this. And this is what wakes up parents as well. If you don't know what's going on with your child's digital world, you chances are you don't know what's going on in their world at all. We have to understand that our children live online. They don't go online. Okay. Um, so definitely keep checking in uh, and keep checking up, getting those devices out of their room. Two of our favorite supports that we recommend would be um, definitely Bark, uh, one of our favorites. And we've got a 10% discount for all of the schools that we work with and the parents. I see that stuttering in the background, mm -hmm. start trying to get going. And then... Of course, Griffin, which is a router that handles your hardware solution. 
But I'm going to close out now, guys, with a little bit of a prize. And I'm going to ask for that final poll to be put up by the Schoolscape team. We've got a virtual school talk that is worth 5,000 Rand on offer. And if you just simply opt in to us getting in touch with you to find out if we can work with you in your school or add value in any way, we're going to select one of the schools that, uh, that's, that choose to be a part of us contacting them uh, to, to uh, win this wonderful prize. I see that our host is back on stage. And I've just <laughs> 20 minutes, so I'm going to hand back to you. <laughs> Awesome. Josh, thank you so much. Um, it is so good to, to have you here with us. Um, see me bouncing. We're doing the, we're doing the, the last one. Not me. Not me. My hands are up here. Um, <laughs> no, it is me. Um, awesome. Thank you so much. I think such valuable information shared. I think as a parent who has kids that are heading into primary school, um, and I thought we were so far from this. I listened to it and, and it does make me nervous. But I'm excited for companies like yours working with our schools, working with our kids, working with us parents. Um, to navigate this with our children. I think that's probably the biggest thing that I've got out of this is talk, talk, talk. I love what you said at the end is have these conversations, open up the conversations. Um, and I think as a school, it's good to know that you don't need to do this all alone. There are companies and people like Josh and Be In Touch guys. There's a couple of other ones that you're going to hear from. And I think the idea is to get these conversations stirring, be it here, hopefully it filters back into your classrooms and filters back into your homes, um, but to get these conversations stirring that we actually are talking to our kids about these um, very real topics and very real things that they are going through. So Josh, um, any final final comment um, before I say goodbye? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, just a massive thank you to Schoolscape. Uh, I think what you guys are doing is fantastic and the way you're innovating is, is wonderful. Just to say to any teachers that are out there, we will be present at both the premier events. So come on down, let's share that coffee. Let's uh, spitball on some ideas on, on how you can keep your kids safer and saner. And then just the last thing to say is that I'm gonna be here in the chat uh, so you can send me any questions directly and I'm happy to post information there. I'll also be around tomorrow if any of your other staff couldn't make today. And thank you so, so much for caring enough to be here. And it's fantastic to see almost 170 pair. Uh, thank you, Scott. <laughs> Great. I'm, I'm going to ask Josh in the background, Josh, if you want to post more information on Barclay and Griffin as well. I have personally gone and looked into these things prior to the time, and they it's a real value into looking at this and showing this possibly with your parents and the schools. Great. So now that we have heard the um, dramatic stance of what is really going on in schools, um, we're going to take a step back and we're going to look at the school as a whole. We're going to unpack this slowly. Uh, welcome, Ashley. I see you on stage. I'm going to... Uh, have a word with you in a second but from going out from here just to the schools know is that we want to start um, at a bigger level and go sort of more granular so we are going to look at now um, really how to keep the fences safe of your school back in the day this would mean bringing Cochrane and Clearview fencing in no more of that now we're really talking about what it is that we need to keep our cyber security safe with the schools so when we talk about now keeping the fences safe we are looking at firewalls we are looking at all kinds of other interesting things that is really going to be the starting point of this discussion of how to do it in your school um, so i know we've said a lot of this is going on outside of the school but there's a lot going on in the school and we're going to look at that now and then we're going to hear from um Louise Lemmer, she is the principal from Mans and Toyota High School, and they've done some brilliant work in the cybersecurity space and some of the reasons of why they decided to go on that journey. But to start off with, the experts, the big guns. Hello, Ashley Lawrence and Kevin Meredith. Um, Ashley is from SonicWall, our cybersecurity partner at Schoolscape, and they are doing some really good stuff focused on education and in the school space in South Africa, really getting to understand your needs and bringing good solutions to meet them. Kevin is from Atomgate, and um, he's the owner there, and he's also gonna, he's really on the ground working with the school, so he knows your language, he knows your struggles. So welcome, Jets. we're excited to have you here, and uh, I'm gonna now hand this over to you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, great. Annika, can you put up the presentation? in a minute <laughs> okay here it okay. comes great fantastic so uh
thank you very much, Ashley. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And I just want to add to uh, Josh's great presentation. Uh, I have two teenage children, uh, 14 and 16. One uh, phone actually charges in my study in the evening. So we've got one down 50% out of the bedroom at night telephone. So one down, one to go. But I will it's use not. your uh, your presentation to kind of uh, add a little bit of leverage this evening. <clears throat> anyway, onwards and upwards. Thanks, uh, Schoolscape. Um, Today, obviously, we've been asked to talk about protecting the fences, and I wanted to mix it up. Again, normally we would present the standard Sonicwall boundless cybersecurity story and talk about our uh, product range and, and go on a deep dive through that stuff. Today, we're going to do it slightly differently. Um, and as Ashley said, we are going to uh, have a conversation with one of our partners, Kevin, uh, who and how their approach to layered security with Sonicwall, and then obviously um, Mrs. Lemma from Amazon Toti is going to take us through some of their stuff. So let me just get straight into it for those who don't know Sonicwall. Um, uh, let's just find the next slide button on here. Uh, of course, I wonder if it is. Oh, there we go. I think Ashley's. Uh, I think Annika may be doing this in the background. Thanks, Annika. <laughs> or maybe even Kevin, any which way, uh, about Sonicall. So Sonicall this year is 31 years old. We are one of the oldest cybersecurity vendors in the world. Um, and we have deployed more than three and a half uh, million firewalls uh, around 550 organizations through 215 plus countries and territories through our 28,000 partners of which Kevin is one of they. Um, See if the page down button. Okay, so I'm actually just going to have to uh, ask Annika to move forward on those slides. Thanks, Annika. Uh, so whenever we get asked to come and speak uh, at these events, the first thing I do on the day of the event, I mean, Kevin and I were chatting earlier this morning, is we just have a quick look online and see what's in the headlines around um, cybersecurity around the world, and especially, obviously, within schools. And needless to say, it's just to illustrate how much schools are being targeted and how often they're being attacked. So here we had, previous one was around websites coming down, 500 or 5,000 websites were taken down in the States. This is an article by a South African company talking about the importance of email security and data protection. Um, and this is from our own website, um, unprecedented explosion of expo exposure points within school. It's talking about administrators, uh, privileges, and, and how much access is being granted without any kind of um, controls. So that's available on our website. Next slide. I also want to show you as much as Ashley said, we weren't going to give you some, some scary data. Um, we do produce as a, uh, as a vendor, we produce an annual threat report and a mid-year update. This is uh, some statistics from last year's uh, report. We actually have a new report due out in March. But I wanted to point out here a couple of these spikes. We have ransomware, uh, and for those, it's increased 151%. And for those who are not 100% familiar, that's the theft or encryption of data for monetary gains. Um, and obviously, and how that's attacking schools and IoT attacks. IoT devices could be something like a smart board, um, a projector, your CCTV camera networks, a printer, anything within the school. So IoT devices increase attack 60%. And I hear everyone saying, but what has that got to do with South Africa? Thank you for the global statistics. Um, well, globally, we are number four uh, in the world for ransomware attacks with just over 10 million attacks. Now, if you divide that by the population, that means one in five South Africans have fallen victim to a ransomware attack. Pretty scary statistic. Again, guys are saying, what's that got to do with schools? Um, that's great, South Africans one in five. Well, here we have um, the top percentage of targeted uh, institutions for ransomware. And we have education and government kind of tiptoeing across the same line throughout the year as the number one targeted uh, entities for ransomware. So what has Sonicwall got in their portfolio? I just have to touch on the boundless cybersecurity products. So we have solutions around email, obviously cloud and on-premises, your cloud and SaaS. So that'll be your 
Office 365 and your G Suite, um, network and cloud security appliances, so your on-premise firewall, um, endpoints, which will be your desktops, laptops, IoT, we've touched on, so that would be smart boards and printers, etc. And of course, your campus-wide Wi-Fi, whether you're lucky enough to have campus-wide Wi-Fi, um, most high schools do, but in certain primary schools and stuff, there may be only certain parts or parts or portions of the campus that are covered with Wi-Fi. So third-party validations, always important uh, for people to understand where we sit amongst our peers. So we have uh, vendor comparisons through the Tolly Group, some very interesting stories around some prevalent uh, vendors in the market and how we compare against those. Um, Ixa Labs, we've just done eight 100% uh, perfect scores. So we did all four quarters last year on, on the uh, no false positives, which is kind of interesting and key if you want to get into the weeds on threat prevention. Um, and all of these reports are available on our website uh, for download. So please feel free to go through and dig into those in any detail. Next slide. So where do you start? So Kevin's going to take through some of his uh, architectures just now, but we always talk about talk talk. Blah, blah, blah. We always talk about a a security assessment. Um, and where does security assessment start? They start with a partner. Where do you find a partner? On our website. Find a partner location. Type in Amir. Select South Africa, and then up pops our. Uh, uh, a map with all our metal tier partners and from there you can click through and it'll take you to oh here you go atomgate uh, then it will also take you to their partner status it will also show you the contact details and most importantly the specialization so uh, and it will highlight the various components that we have within our um uh, product technology stack that they are specialized and have advanced certifications on. So um, again, how do we, uh, you guys have asked for references and case studies. Here we have uh, Cyberno Discovery Center. There are <clears throat> National Science Museum. We also have here uh, some DOM school. They've actually just uh, upgraded their firewalls to Gen 7. Uh, we have Warner Beach and we have Rinish Primary, and of course, this afternoon's guest speaker, uh, Amazon Tati High School. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, Kevin, who's gonna take you through some of his layered security uh, processes and how he works with the SonicWall uh, technologies around it. Thanks, guys. Thanks for that, Ashley. Thanks, Annika. So cool, so I'm Kevin Meredith. I'm from Atomgate. Um, one of the things that everyone here has to realize, we, we've got all these, these eager learners that are trying to get onto the internet. The problem we have is at their age, they, they, they know more than we do, they know more than most of the educators, but they also think that they're really clever, that they actually they think that they know more, which is, which is a bit of a problem because we end up enabling them, but we need to manage them a bit. Um, with all of everyone on the internet, now we've got the teachers that need to connect because they want to improve their classes, they want to make sure that they've got better content and engage the learners a bit better. So we've got them kicking in. Then we've got the admin staff. So you, you need to do your finances and the admin needs to keep the school running. So you've got all of these aspects come together to keep the school going. How do you manage the internet security? How do you manage who's coming in and who's, who's going out? So most schools, um, do not have access to a cyber professional or cyber consultant. So it's key that we find people that can help the schools and, and analyze what the schools need and how to move it forward. Um, and okay, if I can get that, that presentation up, please, thanks. So where we start with, we start with risk assessments. Um, a risk assessment is sounds complex, sounds difficult, but really it's really basic. It's looking at what's happening and understanding the risks around your school, the risk around your assets, what do you do to fix it, and how do you move forward? I'm gonna take you through just the basics of a risk assessment so we can get an understanding of how it works. First thing is that there's, there's forums out there, there's, there's frameworks out there that make it easy and accessible for anyone to do on their own. It is good to do it with a cybersecurity company because they, they're used to it, they know what questions to ask, but it's not the end of the world. You can do it on your own. You can find the frameworks. You get a company called NIST. Um, 
the National Institute for Standards of Technology, and you get CIS, the Center for Internet Security. So have a look at those and get some information on how to do a risk assessment. It's when you break it down and you take your time and you analyze what you need to do and work through it, it's really not that difficult. And actually is an eye opener. It gives you a lot of the information on what you should be doing. Okay, so the first thing when we do a risk assessment, you want to look at all the, the information assets. So what do you have in a school? Sorry, I'm going to go back. <laughs> so what do you have in a school that's important to you, that, that, that makes up your network, that looks... So this isn't just IT things. This is perimeter as well. So an asset is something that you use in a school. It could be data. It could be a computer. It could be a CCTV. So anything that's considered an asset with what we're going to analyze and look through. You then want to look at the, the threats and vulnerabilities on each asset. So the threats and vulnerabilities, what's happening? Can something be hacked? If, if, if there, is there a threat on the internet? If I don't protect the internet, can learners get to vulnerable data? What have we got and what are the vulnerabilities? This is the tricky one because this one could get technical. We actually want an IT company or someone to help you identify the vulnerabilities because on a server, there might be certain vulnerabilities. On IoT devices, there might be, might be vulnerabilities that, that IT companies are aware of or cybersecurity companies are aware of because they're constantly looking at the information in the news. You then need to go through each of your assets. And this is where it gets a bit tedious because you have to do every asset and do a risk assessment. So risk assessment, again, is really basic. Analyze the potential impact. So what is the severity of, of a vulnerability happening or risk happening? And what is the possibility of it happening? If you look at the graph there, it's pretty straightforward. Anything that's negligible, that you know, it's not going to have a high severity rate and it's chances of it happening are minimal to low, oh, it's got a low impact. But the more, the, more, the more you do and the higher you get, the higher the severity and the higher likelihood, we end up with, with a higher score. So what we do with everything now is we rate or rank everything with a score, and that gives you a priority list, what you can work through and how you can move forward. Once you've got your risk assessment done, well, your, your um, analysis done and you, you've ranked everything, you have four actions. So you need to decide on a course of action. So obviously there's avoid, transfer, accept, or mitigate. Avoid, get rid of it. So if you've got an old piece of hardware sitting in the corner and that's a risk, one of the avoid options is to get rid of it, move it away, don't need it anymore. Transfer, so with Office 365 that we've got happening now with Microsoft, it's fantastic. Um, we, when in the past we used to have Microsoft Exchange or a local on-prem, on-premise, a mail server that you had to manage, you had to make sure it was backed up, you had to make sure there was power. So to transfer means we give all that risk and that, that thought process and that complexity away to someone else, give it to Microsoft, let them handle it. Mitigate, that's when we actually look at what we have to have and we say, how do we fix it? So a good example there is you've got internet access. With internet access, we, we need it, we can't give it away to someone else, so we need to mitigate the risk so we'll put a firewall in place, we'll manage it better. Accept, <clears throat> it's as simple as it gets. I understand what the risk is and I accept it and I can move forward. Kevin, you've got a minute left if you are <laughs> to stay aware. Cool, that's good. I'm pretty much done. <laughs> awesome. So I'll summarize quickly. So security is like layers. Onions have layers and so do ogres. So when we look at a, a network, we're looking at all the different access points. So you've got your internet, um, that's all your applications then in the cloud. You've got your network, which is your physical layer, and how do people connect and get to the internet. And then you've got your, your people. Just want to highlight people quickly. People are a risk because people are your threat. They don't understand how network security works. We need to educate and train everyone. And I think that sums it up. Sonic Ball do or have solutions that cover most of those. So from a from our point of view, why we chose SonicWall is because they have all the product sets that covers all those gaps and makes our lives easier to give a good solution. That's awesome. it. Awesome. Kevin, Ashley, thank you so much. I have a question quickly that's come through and I think it's such a good question um, because it's been a big buzz and it's also not a lot of information. You correct Kerry and filtering down from the department on this is that do your assessments include um, 
requirements around POPIA, do they take it into consideration, the protection of information, which is a big one in schools because we're dealing with learners. So does this include it? Has the, um, yeah, ha has you expanded your kind of offerings around something to include some of these things? Um, that would be good. Could you touch on those quickly for us? Sure thing. So POPIA is great. Um, so Protection of Personal Information Act. Um, Fantastic. What Poppy does, it gives you a framework how to protect your data. It doesn't tell you how to, sorry, it tells you what data to protect and what your vulnerabilities are. What where where Poppy and IT work, they work hand in hand. So Poppy has nothing to do, it's it's about data management, but it talks about how to manage the protection and the security. So when we do risk assessments, those are all the things we look at. We look at what is the impact of the data that you have vulnerable and exposed, and how does that relate to the Poppy Act. And if there's a threat, then we need to make a plan and fix it. Awesome. Ashley, anything you'd like to add to that one? Is that pretty thorough? Uh, it's 100%. So, um, you know, as a, as a vendor, a global vendor, we, we're faced with lots of these GDPR, POPIA, there's specific laws in Germany. Um, so it's about data in transit, data at rest, where it's stored and how it's done. And we have various technologies, as, as Kevin's kind of mentioned, which we're not getting stuck into today, about how you <laughs> kind of protect that data. Awesome. Okay. So there we go. If you um, would like the guys from um, Atom Gates with Ashley and them, um, no matter where you are in the country, um, Kevin is up in KZN, but if you're anywhere in South Africa, like Ashley said, there's vendors that can help you. Please click on the polls, click yes in the polls, and they will come in free of charge and do an assessment of your school. So that will include, as like they've said, the things on Poppy um, and all kinds of different areas that I'm telling you now you didn't even know exist as, uh, as threats or holes or vulnerabilities no matter what the correct terminology is. Um, so they will really come in and look at um, how we can, um, yeah, how they can come alongside your school and keep it a little more safe. But let's hear from, um, I never like to use the term the horse's mouth, the expert's mouth, the principal's mouth. <laughs> we need to find a better one of these on Schoolscape. But Louise, very welcome to the Schoolscape stage. You're new to us here and very, very good to have you here today. We are excited to hear your school's journey in this regard. Um, so, perfect. There we go. So, um, yeah, I think that Louise, if you want to take us uh, a little bit into your school's journey on the outset, and then I do have some questions that I would love to ask um, at the end of it because as soon as we said we have you on and sharing your journey, a whole lot of questions came through. So, Louise, I will hand over to you. You need to get those questions to the right people, number one. Firstly, I would like to say I really love the words of Josh right at the beginning, where he said every day should be a safe internet day. I just really like to underline that. So ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I've seen quite a few names that I do know. Um, so you have now heard that I am Louise Lemmer, and I have the privilege of being the principal of a Madison Toti High School. I also need to admit right from the word go that my knowledge of IT is dangerous. And that is exactly the reason why I have surrounded me with the right people, with those people who, are, who do know what they are doing. Um, so Amazimtoji High School is a co-ed school on the South Coast. The school was opened in 1962. And over the years, we have involved, evolved into a school that are really great and who we are today. So we have 950 learners in our school from grade eight to grade 12, 46 educators. We have 72 staff members in total, which includes our educators, our sports department, um, and then obviously also our admin department. I became principal of this school in 2005. And all my studies, all the workshops that I attended, all the courses that I did never ever prepared me for two specific things. Nothing, nothing prepared me for the magnitude of maintenance of buildings and grounds of a school as a school principal. And that what a principal has to deal with. But worse than that, nothing prepared me for the potholes and the disasters that the management of IT could bring to the desk of a school principal. To survive those two headaches, you need to have the help of experts. 
Kevin used the word earlier, basic. I want to say to you, there's nothing basic about the protection of your learners against all those monsters that can come into their world. So we have introduced laptops for all our educators in 2005. The school provided all the educators with laptops, and um, it, that was just the beginning of our IT journey at Masmutoti High School. Some of the educators back in 2005 didn't even know what to do with those things. And I'm convinced some of them were hiding those um, laptops under their beds for a little while. The school soon got to a place where technology played a huge role and we all became more and more reliant on technology. I think as is the case in most schools today. We added more features and we needed better internet. And the more we had a better internet, the more features we added. And there was a definite need for learners to use tablets and smartphones in their classes. So we soon learned that there was a need to understand what was available and the associated risks as well. We wanted our learners to use technology that would be available to them to assist them in all their studies. However, I don't think we quite understood the risks for learners and what was needed to make sure that our learners would not end up exploring all sorts of sites and content that they should not have access to. I don't think we understood well enough how learners, or anyone for that matter, can be exploited through internet. As with businesses, there are now so many schools that are relying on technology. Technology played a huge role during lockdown time and during COVID. Like many other schools, we are using a Google Classroom at our school. So yes, educators and learners do need access to the internet. However, learners need protection more than ever before. All schools should at all times be a safe zone for learners. We, those learners can be protected at all times and that definitely includes the protection from harmful technology. The right protection is not always cheap, but you can't put a price on the safety of learners. We have worked with Atomgate for some time and I'm really grateful for the help and assistance from their side and so um, when the time was right, uh, we could trust Atomgate when they introduced Sonic Wall to us. I didn't even know what Sonic Wall was, out about, was all about before that. And so um, Sonic Wall has the ability to grow as the school matures and the IT systems evolve. Only one access to the internet would be properly managed. Could the, could the next steps be taken to roll out features for wireless internet? to all our learners. We receive detailed traffic reporting on a regular basis from Atomgate. And that allows us to make informed decisions and continue to build our school's future in technology. The system runs seamlessly in the background and requires very little effort from the school as Atomgate administers the sonic wall remotely and is immediately notified of any urgent issues that we might have. The protection of our learners will always remain our top priority. It's never worth the risk of scarring our kids. Damage can be done that could never be taken back again. I know some might argue that the majority of our young people have access at home to anything and to everything. We also understand families are way different from each other with different values, different morals, and different lifestyles. However, as a school, we have the responsibility to do all in our power to protect our learners. We do not always understand all the cyber talk and associated risks. Therefore, we trust and rely heavily on our service providers to advise us on the right solutions. There are always something new on the horizon. The technology landscape changes daily, and it is not always that simple to keep up with it all. Just consider the impact of Poppy. While Poppy is not focused on IT, it does have a direct impact and involves IT in many aspects. As a Toti, at Amazon Toti High School, internet access is dynamically split between admin, educators, and our learners 
we have priority rules in place to ensure that the most important users have access when that is needed. Key users will take priority over lesser users. An example of that is admin over learners. When you need to pay salaries, you need to pay it. Educators also have more freedom to sites that are restricted to learners. You can allow or block based on site content or applications like social media. So why we do not block social media sites for our educators, we do block that for our learners. And just to underline why Sonic Wall plays a vital role. It protects our network so hackers don't get in and get access to our data. Our data is safe. It protects the learner from inappropriate content and it protects the educators and admin from accidentally going into compromised sites and it can happen so easily. And then lastly, it is providing the principal, the management and the SGB peace of mind. Thanks to Sonic Wall, I can sleep peacefully at night, every night. Thank <laughs> Louise, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I love, I love all that you shared, I think. Um, and it's such a good journey. And I, I think that many schools are probably um, starting out only on this journey now. And I think my one question just to you is, is maybe, maybe two quick, quick, we have a minute for questions. And I, I wanted to say, what kind of convinced you to start this journey to reach out to a company like Sonic Wall um, or Attengate to really take your cybersecurity and your school's online and digital presence with your learners and staff seriously? Um, you know, what was that kind of push to do it? The first one was the lack of knowledge that we have. We are, we are not expertise in this field at all. So you need someone and we then obviously got to know that some of our learners are way too clever and they can hack into so many things that um, um, they, are, they are brilliant at what they can do. So they know things that we don't know. And I can say too, we have had a few um, great incidents of um, learners that are brilliant at what they do. And so we've learned very quickly that we needed help. And um, so I don't know whether we would ever get to a point where we would say that we are 100% safe. In, um, in that, um, but we also know that um, with Sonic Wall and the updates of that constantly, um, mm -hmm. that it does give peace of mind. Awesome, awesome. The last thing I think maybe I need to ask, and that's just to set everyone's minds at ease, and a quick question around here is, how did Sonic Wall and Atomgate really fit into your school's budget? Because I think our biggest constraint in this mm -hmm. is that there's a real belief that if we're going to take on, let alone spending all the money on the devices and to actually bring the devices in, um, but now to spend on top of that on, on security that does secure all these devices. And then how, um, how's your approach been and how has Sonic Wall Atomgate really helped you budget and kind of get all what you need in your school when you needed it? Ashley, first of all, you are 100% right. It is expensive. Um, but as I've said earlier, you can't put a price to um, to the safety of your of your of your learners. You do not want them to be scarred and to be harmed. And so, yes, in order to have something like Sonic Wall in your school, you need to put it in a budget. You need to work towards that and understand what the cost would be, um, and then make sure that it is in your school budget, and then that you can afford that. And so, from there on, yes. Um, You've got to continue to do that and um, it's worth it it is a hundred percent worth that i can do without a lot of other things in the school that we can cut down on but not on on sonic wall because of the safety that it provides beautiful so louise i think um yeah from us well done well done on prioritizing um and putting your learners and staff safety first um it's not like we would have schools without fences i think their kids <laughs> might be at greater risk of uh, having no fences and having a sonic wall at the moment. Um, so I might get in trouble saying that though, so I won't. But um, yeah, I want to encourage everyone, there's a poll out. Um, if you would like Sonic Wall um, to come and do that free risk assessment at your school, there's no strings attached, um, please get hold of them. What I want to say on the finance side, I have seen Ashley and his team fit, uh, what, elephants into mole holes when it has come to budgets and uh, constraints and really working for the schools um, and so yeah get hold of, of sonic wall through that poll someone will contact you and let's know what's going on in our schools rather um 
be aware than in denial, I'd say. Um, and then let's work towards solutions like um, Louise has done at her school. So thank you, Louise. Thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you, Kevin. Um, we appreciate your time and um, sharing your experience and your expertise with us. And yeah, we uh, look forward to seeing them at Schoolscape. So if you have great questions, hunt them down at Schoolscape event, come and join us there. Um, and then you can post them face to face. I'm going to say goodbye to all of you and we're going to wrap up with our last session now. Um, and I am going to ask an old friend of Schoolscapes onto the stage. This is another Kevin. This is Kevin Sherman. And Kevin Sherman is from um, Cloud EDU. So Cloud EDU mostly focuses on the deployment and servicing of schools in the realm of devices, um, Google, lots of Chromebooks. I had a very good laugh recently because I have a Chromebook and I work on a Chromebook. And I was prepping for this and I typed in, um, I was looking for the company that's speaking tomorrow, actually, it's called Break Free, um, and they're speaking on porn. And so I typed Break Free Porn into my device, then, what do I call it, shrilled with fear, slammed my device closed and thought, oh my gosh, what is going to come up? Luckily, Erica, my brave colleague, was sitting next to me, she opened it, and well, there was a pop-up that said, sorry, this content can't be displayed because it may be of inappropriate nature. So I was very impressed with my Chromebook that Kevin and them have provided on multiple levels, but today we're not here to talk about Chromebooks. I was uh, just personally quite um pleased, shall I say, when uh, there was nothing damaging to my poor eyes that came up. Kevin, welcome on stage. This is Kevin Sherman, and he looks after, he's the expert in professional development for teachers, but he's also got 25 years of being both in schools, teaching himself, I think, and now on the other side of it, of helping schools in this digital journey. So a very big welcome. It's good to have you here today. Hello to everybody. I see a bunch of our school clients out there, so I can't too many names to name. Um, but welcome to all of you guys. In fact, I was 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 with Karine yesterday at Lair School Akistad in Stellenbosch, and I think she's watching today. Um, Ashley, I did I stalled in coming on because I wanted you to tell that story. So I, I'm glad uh, I'm glad that trick worked. I also need to just one little correction. I have unfortunately earned this gray hair. It's closer to 35 years in education. And I was, I was just, <laughs> I, know, I, I appreciate the, uh, the downward uh, number counting, but I was trying to recall where my first experience was with dealing with digital safety. And I, I, had, a, I had a classroom website in, starting in 1994. There we go, I've now dated myself. And, and that really was the first kids. experience, right? I had kids online doing stuff and I had to consider the digital safety ramifications. Uh, there was no real thing called social media back then, but we did have still other digital dangers that existed. And I had to explain what was going on to parents. So I have been doing this quite a long time and, and I'll share what I can uh, in the time we have. Awesome. So we were just gonna chat. We this are just going like to a, a coffee meeting, but I have water. We we have felt like you've sat through quite a lot of the presentations and a lot of information shared. And we thought Kevin and I can chat, so why not have a chat online and invite you all into it? And please, as I am addressing some topics with Kevin, put the questions in the question bar. I will ask him here on stage. And I think that really where we can start with is when we think about this topic of digital dangers, we've heard a lot about school, teacher, parent, but who needs to be hearing about um, this webinar today? And, and who needs to be having these conversations, Kevin? Well, I, so I, I want to thank the principal who was on earlier because she was quite, she made herself quite vulnerable and admitted that, wow, this stuff can feel overwhelming. And unfortunately, the answer is everyone has a role to play. And just like we have a role to play when students enter our school grounds, we all as educators have a role to play in keeping them safe in the digital grounds that we have. But really, teachers are on the front line. Um, my heart is always with teachers. And uh, because they're on the front line, it's actually th this sort of notion of a danger, which is a, a, a word I try to avoid when talking on, about this topic, is th because that can create a barrier to teachers to using technology. Schools say they want to be innovative. They say they want to be cutting edge. But the way to do that is actually to reduce the number of barriers. So some of the products that you may have heard about today and tools will help with that. 
Um, but ultimately, we have to support teachers when they take a risk, and we also have to empower teachers. So giving them more knowledge and more opportunity is one way to do that. Principals and heads of schools also have to be concerned about their staff and students, and obviously the negative publicity that can arise with, with, a, with an issue, we'll call it. Um, parents, critical to the role, and, and I really liked your, your first presenter's focus on that personal story and on the, the need for parents to be considered. School governing bodies have to be aware of the pitfalls and be supportive of, of implementing solutions, and sometimes that means spending money. Um, but as with any danger to children, it's really society as a whole. Uh, there, there's just an, a need for everybody to become more informed without becoming panicky. And that's always a bit of a challenge, is how do you strike that balance? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I think I certainly sit here and hear these things and I, I, I feel like there is, a, there is a realm of panic, but we're not doing that today. We're not here for fear mongering. Um, we're definitely not here to create more anxiety around it, but it's a discussion. And, 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 you know, I think when we look at it, we need to have policies and structures in our school. And I said policy, and then we had a debate about policy when we were chatting a few days ago. So, we're going to look at policy now because apparently Ashley didn't know what policy meant when it comes to technology. Um, I'm a bit like the school teacher on the background that is, is laptop, laptop, I can do this well, but anything deeper, it gets a bit murky. But really, um, I think schools do need a certain set of rules around devices, around cell phones, around all kinds of things when it comes to having technology in a school. You know, they need to have some kind of playbook. So when we look and discuss the term policy in edtech can be a bit confusing what do we mean by that and, and where do we start with the policies in the schools okay so let's break down that word policy because when i hear the word policy i'm often in, me in a meeting with my business partner alistair who's, who's probably in the chat telling you all about our upcoming conference but we have two kinds of policies that we have to be concerned with one is the are the written policies so do we have an acceptable use aup policy that's where most schools started in 1990s, 2000s, and maybe some schools are still adopting those kinds of policies today. I personally like to keep it simple. So the idea of having multiple policies where people have to figure out where, where is what, I think it's easier to say we're gonna have a digital uh, usage policy or a, a digital learning policy, keep it broad in general and include everything under that umbrella. But that's the written policy. Those are the things like, do we allow social media? Do we not allow social media? What happens when a student breaks the rules? All those kinds of written policies that the principals would be used to. It's important to involve your staff in the development of those policies and where possible parents so that they're aware of the policy as it's in development and the kinds of conversations that are taking place. Uh, sometimes policies get written in the back room and they're sort of presented and then you don't have buy-in or understanding. And so I think involving people in a process may take longer in the short run, but makes life easier in the long run. The other kind of policy though, uh, oh, and there's one other point I wanted to make about policies. When you're working with your staff, uh, especially for this is the message to principals, when you're working with your staff, you have to recognize that a 25-year-old teacher's relationship to, say, TikTok is going to be very different than your 50-year-old teacher's understanding of something like a use of Facebook. And you have to kind of accept that there's going to be different approaches to those social media platforms. And if I had said TikTok to you guys two years ago, you wouldn't have even known what I was talking about. So that's a, a part of the challenge is these things are always evolving. Um, but the other kind of policy is a little on the technical side. So there's the, the principal, what the principal would know is a policy, a written document, then there's a technical policy. And in terms of technical policies, we also have um, things like, and I know this is true for, for Google uh, because we work with Google primarily, but this would be the case in Microsoft. You have what are called technical policies that you can impose. So you, with Google, for example, we can set policies on the platform uh, that will enable students to use email and send email only to each other within grade three, but they can't send email outside the school. That's a technical policy that would be implemented on the, what we call the admin console. Um, we can also decide what applications are available. Those are also policies. So just in the, it, tomorrow when you come back for this webinar, when you hear people talking about policies, you just have to think, are they talking about a technical policy? Are they talking about a written policy? It's very good. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Um, and you know, um, yeah, Kevin, I think I think that 
it's a very good point you made about policy setting. Um, I think that it's a it's a it's a stance that our, our politicians in our country could take a bit more on as a inclusive policy setting. Um, <laughs> I think that yeah, I think getting parents in to set policies like this for buy-in is a brilliant idea. That you know earlier someone said, how do we get our parents to take phones out of bedrooms? Well. Set policies at school that you can help your parents translate in the home, um, and I, I think I think that that that's that's a great point. Um, I like it very much. We've looked at quite a bit about um, the different roles in schools, but just your opinion on on whose role is this in a school? Is it the head's role to um, direct and everything? Is it a, is it a teacher's role to keep the learner safe? Is it a learner's role to just be responsible? Give us your opinion on this one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to all that above. I'll, I'll be above. <laughs> um, well, look, the principals in the in this webinar know are very fully aware that everything eventually lands on their desk. So, but I I'm somebody who believes in delegated responsibility, and what that means is you have to delegate some of that responsibility to your deputies. You have to delegate that responsibility to the classroom. So teachers do have a responsibility to manage their classrooms effectively and create a safe digital space. That might mean that those teachers need some support in terms of professional development and training so they know how to manage those spaces because that's not something they were taught when they got their B.Ed. degree, for example. And then there's obviously responsibility on the learner. Now, the responsibility of a grade one learner is very different than the responsibility of a grade 12 learner. But I, I, went, I, I worked with a principal once who gave me this saying, and I repeat it every chance I get. As educators, we have to make the implicit explicit so when we think we know the rules or we think we know what the correct behavior is we can't assume that the learners know that we have to make that quite explicit you can do that through policies but learners aren't sitting around reading school policies you've got to make this stuff really clear and explicit to learners and the only way you do that is by creating opportunities for digital learning and digital engagement Otherwise, it's easy for a school to say, oh, there's too much stuff out there. We're not going to mess around with this. We'll let the parents worry about it. But I think there needs to be a balance between what happens at home and what happens in school. Awesome. Awesome. Do you want to uh, mention more on principles there? Or should we, yeah, I can, should we I, leave so I, I have lots of rabbit holes I can go down. Um, really, there's always a tension uh, in these. And you, I think you even came across that a little bit today, where you heard from IT managers, you heard, or you heard from principal, from a principal. And there's always a little bit of a tension between the IT manager and the principal. I have to say I have a bias, and that is because I'm a former educator. My bias is towards the school making decisions and having the IT manager implement that. Often when we visit schools initially, we find the IT manager is controlling the IT and making the decisions. And if the IT manager is making the decisions, that leaves teachers with very little control over a digital environment. So you do have to have an IT manager on, on your side. They have to be part of the team. They have to work with you. But the decision should be an academic decision based on what's best for the child. And then the IT manager should be implementing those decisions. You would never walk into a business, and I've been working with some businesses lately, teaching them how to use Google Classroom. Those businesses are not being dictated to by their IT team. They are driving the decision making, and the IT team is in support of the business's mission. The same needs to be true in schools. So the school then has to take ownership. And this is where, again, it's going to fall back on the principal. You can't say, oh, I'll let my IT manager worry about creating a digitally safe environment, because then you are not engaged with those policies. You're not going to have clear answers for parents. You're not going to be working instructionally and academically with your teachers to ensure that they're creating learning opportunities. So this has to be an all school effort, including that principal IT manager balance. Awesome. OK. Um, Kevin, I think whatever school doesn't have a dedicated IT manager, and, and I think follow on to that, I want you to answer a question, but I've, I've been thinking about this um, and maybe they comment on it, you know, if a school isn't equipped or prepared to, or, or is, is, is feeling terrified about the dangerous side of bringing technology in, is it worthwhile still to be a school that is looking to innovate, to implement the yeah. technology? I think many schools are sitting between this rock and a hard place, I got, you know, of, do we bring the devices in? Is it worthwhile? 
are we just exposing our kids to a world out there that we don't feel like we can protect them from? Just some of your perspective on that. Yeah, look, it's it's a challenge for schools um, that are under-resourced, certainly. If they don't have a dedicated IT manager, there's no question that's a challenge. One of the things that, that I love about the Google platform is that it's so easy to manage that even a former English teacher like myself can get in, create users, create groups, and do some of that management. I, I know my colleague Deidre is laughing at home in Pretoria as I say that right now because she's probably watching, but it really is easy to manage and that's what we try to do when we work with schools we want to empower the school to manage its own it so it's not reliant on outside service providers that's one way we break the model and make technology accessible to all schools so that's that's a kind of a google perspective on things um, but we have worked with hundreds of schools to help them create that simple to manage environment and that's one of the things even when you're we're talking about a subject like digital safety one of the things that you have to balance that with is ease of implementation. If a system becomes so complicated that people don't use it, you can't create that safe environment. So you've got to create an environment that's not just safe, but easy to use. And that includes devices. Now, I personally have a very strong feeling about this, that we need to prepare our learners for the future. And they are already walking around with devices. We are all walking around with devices, instructional support, teaching and learning without devices isn't very 21st century. It's much more 19th century. So I'm not saying devices need to be used all day long in a school, but I think we have to be implementing devices into the classroom. And we're seeing that in lots of schools. Obviously the pandemic forced that on a lot of schools, um, but we're, we want to see that continue, but in a thoughtful, um, deliberate way, rather than the sort of panic, we have a pandemic and we've got to go into lockdown way. I think now teachers have, have developed their skills enough where they can see value and now they can figure out, okay, what are the best things to do with this technology? But when you're looking at devices, you have to select devices that are easy to manage. Apple has systems for that. Google has uh, the amazing Chromebook that you've mentioned that is just incredibly easy to manage from the Google admin console. Uh, and there are other third party tools that can help teachers. Uh, we work with a, a Dutch company that, for example, that enables teachers to see what's happening on student screens. Now, that, I don't think that's a necessity, but it's certainly a wonderful thing to have that access to be able to tap on a screen and then also to freeze that screen if the kid is doing something inappropriate. <laughs> um, those are the kinds of digital tools that we have now um, that we did not have when I started doing this 30 years ago uh, that enable uh, teachers to be much more in control of what's going on in the class and not feel that the space itself is could be dangerous. So if I bring technology in, uh, is something bad going to happen? We can create spaces that teachers feel safe to take risks and be innovative. Awesome. Awesome. Kevin, thank you so much. Um, I think that is, um, yeah, it's a really good perspective on it, a simple perspective and a really good place to start. Um, I want to encourage everyone, if you would like Kevin to, um, yeah, to, if you'd like to start a conversation with Kevin and the guys from Cloud EDU, there's a lot of value around security that they can provide but there's a lot of other things to schools that they can also do a lot of good training on and a lot of development on and a lot of um input on um even on the device level um i'd like to encourage you to pop yes please let them contact me in their poll um in the poll section and kevin or alistair one of them will be uh available to have a good chat with you Thanks, guys Ashley. my email is also in the chat um yes. feel free to email me i give away free half hour consultation where you can sort of get all the stuff that's in my head in the last 30 some odd years of, of doing these things in in schools um so principals please feel free Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I like doing that. I like those conversations. Awesome. I think, um, yeah, I want to encourage Yaku Fanamava asked, could you get a policy to use as a framework? I think the best thing would be to do is have a consultation with Kevin. Um, he will help look at your school, what you currently have and how to, I don't want to say better, but increase it, adapt it, um, maybe make it more relevant to the times and the tech that you have in your school. So go ahead and uh, connect with Cloud EDU. We've worked with them for years and I can really recommend them as a, um, a very reliable source of help. It's also who I run to when I have problems with my device. So <laughs> I can personally say they're great. Right. I think we are now finished up for today. I want to spotlight 
quickly after this what's coming tomorrow but kevin i'm going to say thank you so much thank and you very much it's good to have you on stage okay. kevin and yeah you can drop off now kevin and the cloud edu team will be also at our schools get premier event i'm going to say this again we are going back to live events and if you're part of your school's management team um please come and join us at schools get premier in march 4th in cape town we say cape town but actually it's in Stellenbosch this year so at the beautiful proteo hotel and techno park overlooking the mountains we're going to have a wonderful time together lots of coffee we're talking a thousand cups of coffee so come have a good cup of coffee on us lots of nice food maybe a wine tasting because we're in the winelands after that i don't know if i'm allowed to say that live but please there's going to be a link that comes up now, um, as well as a, a notification that comes up on the screen when we're done. And uh, click there and register for free. The last thing I would like to say is tomorrow, Jam Packed, we are really taking a deep dive into the world of explicit content and porn for kids. How do we work with our kids on this one? Um, so that's going to be good. Alistair Payne from Cloud Edu is going to look at cyberbullying in depth. What are some of the really practical handles we can do around that? As well as Dean from My Social Life um, is going to look at some of those social emotional aspects of kids worlds that they're living in um, and solutions around those things and that and he is always a treat to have on stage so he'll be hosting with me tomorrow thank you have a lovely evening off you go back to your families um, and i hope that this has been really valuable we will see you tomorrow